Fella, 33 degrees. Oh my goodness, I wish it weren't so cold. I'm begging, please. Can I go to Tunisia, Iran, or Mexico? Because here outside, my goodness, look at all the snow. Actually, you can't see it. You're just going to have to believe. <laughs> hey, cold Canada. Yeah, it is snowing here. How about in Yemen? Any snow in Tunisia? Super fluency family woman. Dalel in the house. Blanca here. Nadia here. Claudia here. Who else do we have? Missing you too. I'm coming to Tunisia. More on that soon. For real this time. Tunisia, I need you. When can I return? Let's see some other countries here. Oh, I can't forget. Somebody uh, messaged me today and said, you know, I can never come to the live sessions, but I watch and I see all the countries represented. MAP is here from Argentina. And she said, I'm from Uruguay or Uruguay. She said, can you give a shout out to, to I'm going to say it in American English, to Uruguay. And I said, of course. So big shout out to all the English language teachers in the wonderful country of Uruguay. I love the politics there. What's going on with education in Uruguay? It's so exciting. I hope to get down there and be a part of that at some point. That's one of my dreams. What else do we have? What other countries do we have here? This is the festival. This is ELT Techniques, the festival. If you haven't seen your country on there, get it on. Let's see. Let's see. I know we have some more people here. Egypt in the house. Okay, put your country up even if you already put it up. <laughs> Mexico, Bulgaria. Julie in New York City. Algeria, Serbia. Wonderful to see everybody. This is uh, officially our last week of the course. This is where you got to put the sad faces in. Aww. Uh, but the good news is... Next week, which is a week scheduled for doing uh, post-class assignments and getting them into us, <laughs> the sad faces. Yeah, but I'm, I got the good news now. Barbara is here from Greece. Excellent, excellent. Barbara, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that horribly, but uh, so uh, the good news. Yes, good news. Back to the good news. Next week, because we need to do a couple, of we've got uh, if we to this weekend. Uh, with, and I think we're saying hello, it's, it's Dr. Brody in the house, yay! I'm just doing a few messages here, I'm glad, hey, she is, everybody. Hey, Doc, give me one second, and I'm just going to finish a, a, an important message, which is, next week, if we include Saturday in next week, which I'm going to do, since Friday is sort of officially the last day of uh, ELT Techniques, we have uh, a makeup class. It's going to be ESLHipHop.com. Steve, My Stephen Mayu is going to do his class Saturday. We have the inimitable, I can never say that word. I can write it right, correctly, usually. Uh, Sean Bonville, so excited for his class. I'm listening to the news. Great stuff happening in the pre-class task with that. He's coming uh, next week. And I've got a couple surprises for you. You'll find out later for the end of this week and next week. We're going to fill up next week with more stuff. We have more people joining. Uh, they there won't be post tasks with those. They'll just be classes that we have. If you can check them out live, excellent. If not, you can check out the recordings. And without further ado, I will present to you Dr. Crystal. I say Brody. I know a lot of other Americans must say Brody, but it's Browdy. Is that correct, Doctor? <laughs> Brody. Naughty. Bro Naughty Brody. <laughs> All right. I will never call it you Brody again. It's Naughty Brody or Naughty or Brody like Naughty, Naughty like Brody. <laughs> I like that. that. I'll collocate that. Uh, Dr. Crystal Brody was with us in the last MOOC for vocabulary. She did a really great class on uh, very practical techniques to use with students, which is her specialty, I think. Uh, she's a, a great with communicating not only with students but with other teach work, teachers and networking. She's a, a big believer in the future of online education and involved in projects with that. And that's where I'm going to stop. And I'll let you, Naughty Brody, uh, continue and tell us a little more about you, who you are and what you do. I will disappear, and you can summon me back, and I will put my video and audio back on. All right? Take it away, Dr. Brody. Naughty Brody. In the house. <laughs> Hi, y'all. And um, thank you so much for having me. And uh, this one is for first, make sure that everybody can hear me. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Very low. Okay, I got a lot of thumbs coming in. Okay, awesome. 
So um, um, Jace asked me to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have been in the field of language teaching um, since the mid-80s, actually. And um, as a native of Germany, um, teaching, um, um, in teaching in Germany, uh, to Turkish students, German as a foreign language, and English as a foreign language in Germany. And then here now I'm training teachers in the United States, where I'm a professor in a college in, uh, in the state of Kentucky. Um, if you're wondering where this is, this is kind of considered a southern uh, mid-Atlantic state, um, northern of uh, Tennessee. Um, the reason I'm interested in foreign languages is that I grew up in a region in Europe where we were surrounded by many, many, many different languages. And um, yet at school, instruction was um, so inefficient. You know, even though I, I noticed today that I now know knew a lot more than my daughter. What I does today here in foreign language classes, but um, Crystal, yeah, Crystal, I'm uh, Dr. Patty. I'm just going to interrupt you to say I think the microphone is okay, but if you could get a little closer to it or a little uh, or speak up a little bit, I think that that would help a lot. Okay, let me try this one. Is this better? Is this better? Guys? Better, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, I'm leaning forward and I'm leaning in. <laughs> okay. So um, I uh, I had really bad language instruction in Germany um, at, in my days, and actually had to repeat an entire year um, of uh, school because of bad grades in English class. And that was really kind of bizarre because I liked language teaching a lot always, and I thought there must be a better way of teaching languages to kids um, that are more that's more effective. So that's where everything stems back to that time. So I uh, I hope you cannot all relate to my experience. <laughs> but a lot of language instruction was geared around grammar instruction and uh, not communication. So you can probably um, imagine that that's not the approach that I'm taking. So let me talk a little bit about. I'm so excited that this is uh, breaking down the MOOCs into different subfields. Um, and, um, you know, giving us opportunity to talk about all of them in depth, you know, and uh, understanding that they all come together in, in the intersection of connecting with your students, making learning authentic to students, and uh, real, and getting them excited, you know. Um, that, that's the most important thing, instead of um, reciting uh, endless grammar conjugations and so forth. So um, let's look into my presentation from that end. And uh, as you can already see from my first slide, you know, uh, to me, listening is learning. Because listening is where students start their language production. Uh, and it's a very, 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 very active state, psychologically speaking. Um, I got my PhD in second language acquisition later, and uh, I can tell you, you know, there's so much going on in the brain, and uh, I, I want to talk with you a little bit about how to make it easier for students to actually take a lot away from it, and also that you know it. So let's go to the next slide. Dave, would you be able to do that for me, because I have trouble leaning forward, and, uh, and all the time, okay, perfect. All right, so my presentation is called Input Does Not Intake, because I think most teachers can relate to the fact that um, you, you do a wonderful lesson and you're so pleased with yourself, and um, then later on you discover that students really didn't get out of the lesson what you were hoping they were getting out. I discovered this uh, many times as a language teacher myself, uh, trying out different uh, methods. Um, I I um, had students up several times for several years and uh, discovered when I tried different methods that sometimes in year three or year four they faltered terribly because um, they just couldn't make the connection. Um, when I focused too much on fun and too much on games, uh, they couldn't make the connections because the foundations were not there. or um, Likewise, you know, we focus too much on foundations and then they couldn't actually apply it because they never learned how to authentically communicate. So I went through several different evolutions as a teacher. And uh, what I'm telling you here today is kind of a um, combined experience of all of that. So let's move to the next slide if we could. 
Okay, can we move to the next? Okay, thank you. So, first of all, in most language classes, of course, we know that students spend much more time uh, listening than speaking. And we oftentimes forget that listening is a very, very active production task uh, where students already produce language. And, um, and of course, you know, many teachers, as I said before, don't know um, how to know what the students learned. Jade, could you move, please? Thank you. So, as in all my presentations, whatever I um, do, I preface with the fact that um, every teacher needs to know as much as he can about the students and have a really personal relationship with the students to always make learning authentic. So, the more you know what the students are coming from and what their reality is and what their interests are, the more authentic you can be to them. And that could be also academic topics if that's what moves them, you know. But you know, my preface is whatever you teach, always make sure it's embedded in a very personal relationship that's authentic. Next please. Okay, so that's just, I just put that in because I like it. Can we go to the next? <laughs> We're going to talk about overall language goals, and I just want to um, um, revisit what our goals are in language class. You know, I'm, I'm assuming that lots of you have students for a longer time, not just for a short time. So you want to take your students from um, concrete to abstract, from familiar to unfamiliar, from generic to specific or sometimes technical, um, from explicit to implicit, from informal to formal, and single words to extended discourse. And I know that Jade, um, with his call program and support, does a wonderful job in all of this, you know, but we need to be very mindful when we start with students in the beginning to always keep in mind where we're starting, okay? We're starting in concrete, we're starting in familiar, we're starting in generic, we're starting in explicit, we're starting in informal, in single work to move on to more complexity, okay? Can we move on, please? Next slide. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, Jay, can we move to the next slide? Yeah, sorry, I got signed out of the session somehow, but I'm back. One moment. We cannot be without Chase. It's impossible. <laughs> so, so I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, so here's one example of language classes that just don't work very well, you know, where um, we have words on the board or words um, presented to students that have no context, you know, where it, it just removed of any authentic discourse, you know, and uh, it may be really cute and all and have all the information on it, but it doesn't help students to communicate like songs do and as I said, these programs, you know, um, make that happen. Okay, next one, please. So, um, now here, here are some examples that are a little bit better for listening activities um, that I wanted to give you some ideas of how um, when you are listening, when students are listening, that they need to have more information to decode what they're saying. Because um, all they're hearing in the beginning is like almost like a machine in the background. You know, they, they hear this whir, 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 and every once in a while they hear sounds they recognize and we need to give them uh, cues, you know, to pick out words and information that they can uh, then fill in the blank, you know, with more information. So um, the more explicit you can be, the better. And today on my blog, I have a lot of information on how to find uh, resources and pictures, videos, and create your own videos and audio casts um, to give your students the guidance in all language production, whether it's listening or all the other skills too to be able to um, make sense out of information they hear. Because at this point, in the early production, it's still only generic information to them and not language. Next, please. 
Next slide, please. So here, here are some uh, some words I want to throw out at you. You know, um, when when you are creating um, activities for your students for listening, um, you know, and, and you are in in the business of having to write this out, or you want to write this out, I recommend using uh, verbs like these to um, plan your teaching activities because sometimes when you use words like students will know or students will um, learn or something. That doesn't give you really a lot to work with, you know, but when you frame your activities with words like describe, um, you know, or explain or compare, contrast, and so forth, this will help you to already um, create a more authentic um, teaching situation that, um, you know, makes it necessary for you to give your students a lot of cues. And it kind of forces you to be more resourceful in your listening activities as you're going from the start to the end, okay? Next one, please. Next slide, yes. So, any spoken language that you throw at the students, um, you know, should involve things like processing, understanding, interpreting, and evaluating. And, and this is really important to understand for the brain, you know, it's not just to sit there and take it, or it's not just sit there and, and listen. I mean, they actually need to have their brains involved. And if you frame your own activities in ways that, um, that actually label the brain activities with a word, then it, it's a whole different way of approaching the activity that we do, okay? So next please. Crystal, I'm just going to say, I, there are a few comments about just a bit louder. I've asked people to turn up their speakers, but maybe you need to turn your microphone up just a bit or speak a little okay, more loudly. Okay, I, uh, I try to speak. Does that just help a little bit? Or? It might just be your voice. Just if, if you want to speak up a little more, I think that would really make a difference for people. And I'll give you the next slide. Now we hear nothing, <laughs> or I don't hear anything. <laughs> I think you might have turned it off. Yep. Dr. Crystal Brody. Well, I'm she? here. Okay. I'm here. Can you hear me better now? I don't know. Keep talking. Oh. Keep, <laughs> keep going. Okay. Keep going. Here, yeah. now Okay, now we're talking about tools that we're going to be using for classroom activities. So I'm going to become a little bit more technical now because I want us to think about what kind of tools and uh, um, supports we can use to make uh, listening activities more successful with students. Okay, next slide. Jake, can you hear me? <laughs> So let's talk about uh, the brain again. You know, what does the brain need in order to understand listening um, activities? Everybody uses realia in uh, language teaching, uh, which is newspapers and real life stuff like uh, clothing, items. When I when I um, was teaching uh, language classes, I went to secondhand stores. And uh, got a lot of uh, real life stuff and put them in suitcases in the room. And I was using a lot of real life objects, you know, um, suitcases with um, real stuff. Anything that students can manipulate with their hands, pictures, photos, diagrams, any kind of media, any kind of things that involve physical movement like balls, um, hula rings, um, jumping ropes, um, films and videos, audio models. And a lot of these things can be used um, with technology, of course, too. And then, of course, 
any graphic tool that you can have um, will help students to um, decode language as they're hearing it at the same time, like charts, graphic organizers, graphs, timelines, and number lines. If you prepare those kind of uh, sheets and you um, give them listening activities, they can use those things alongside to give their brain something to actually do and actively listen as they're producing something like making uh, lines from one object to another or taking down words. Um, you know, this is exactly what you can use then to see if they can actually um, learn what you do. Next slide, please. So here, here are some ideas that you can do um, depending on, um, I, I always, uh, I didn't have to teach um, normal school subjects with languages, but I did do it because I knew my students were um, always learning them anyway. And I thought it was very authentic for the students to follow up and they love math and science in particular. And I thought social studies was a really good topic to bring into language studies because it gives them a lot of the history and the the culture of the country, you know, when you talk about geography and those kind of things. So I'm going to give you some examples for sensory supports for content um, that um, I'm not going to go over everything in detail because you can uh, look at the uh, presentation later um, when you um, when we're finished with this and pick out the stuff that you like. But I just wanted to give you a list of things that are supportive of um, different topics in the classroom. My students always loved math because we, we did like math games and competitions and they really loved that and um, it just depends on your group, um, what authentic discourse for your group. Um, social studies of course is always good because you always want to do um, geography, get to know the country and so forth and language arts is kind of the basic anyway. So use whatever you want to use later. I don't need to re read everything here and we can go to the next slide. Next slide please. Okay, here are some examples of um, graphic organizers. I am just completely smitten and in love with graphic organizers. I think graphic organizers are awesome. Um, you know, I would never do any activity like um, watching a movie or audio cast or anything without giving students graphic organizers for um, their information. Jake, could you click one more time? I think graphic organizers didn't come in completely yet. No, didn't come in. I'm sorry about that. Some parts of my PowerPoint seem to have gotten lost. Um, the graphic organizers. Um, you know, if you look at the lower left side, the supermarket one is a German example. Um, you can start with your students in your own language of um, the country and ask them, what do you want to know about shopping? What kind of words do you want to know um, when you talk about shopping? And, and uh, the students can later on fill this out, you know, and you can list things to them. And um, on the lower right side should be a cheat chart but it's, it's gone. A cheat chart is one where you have a line on top and a dividing line and they could uh, compare and contrast and put stuff in. Um, and so we can go on to the next slide please. So the next topic is um, what kind of tasks we can use to have authentic language in our classroom. Okay, let's see you next slide. So here, here are some ideas, you know, and this is specifically for people um, that don't have a school curriculum where you are teaching somewhere and um, actually there's, I wanted to tell you, there are pictures, photos on all slides, but somehow uh, some stuff didn't get transferred. So maybe when you look at the recording, maybe you can see um, the, uh, the full, you know, all the pictures. So here are some ideas that you can use for, um, you know, if you need to do your own curriculum at school, uh, when you do listening activities, you know, you can talk about 
class and school rules. You know, that's always a good topic. Personal information about the students and their families. Um, the school building itself, where you are, um, what kind of rooms are there, and what are their names. Maybe you can even um, make signs and have the students take them somewhere and affix them to doors and items. What kind of subjects are taught at the school? What, are, what kind of people are working at the school and what are their roles? And what activities are going on at the school um, outside of academics? And start with that information because that's very authentic to the students to listen to you and they will make, be able to make the connection. Next one. And again, here's also I have pictures and all the empty slides. Hopefully, you'll see them later. Um, and then you can move on to the outside of school um, topics like the hobbies, likes and dislikes, family, skills they have, emotions, and food, and move on to those topics and uh, see how they're doing with that um, in your second um, shift of listening activities. Next, please. So I wanted to reiterate, you know, um, that all the teaching of listening um, means that in the listening activity, students really need to kind of trust the teacher to take the lead and um, to make it easy for them to um, decode. And it needs to be authentic and built on a good relationship between teacher and uh, student. And the students need to actually have a reason to listen. And that's where the props and the graphs and all those things come in. So they actually have make the listening activity active and make it a production activity and not just a passive being showered of, with language stuff because that doesn't generate any results. Um, every listening activity should be framed by an objective that has an active word associated with it because that frames the teacher's uh, activity very much on how we approach this teaching activity. And uh, we need to give them a lot of tools, you know, to be able to decode independently and create a lot of knowledge. And uh, then we talked a little bit about uh, what are topics for beginning listening activity. So let's go to the next one, please. So now I want to give you some examples of measurable listening activities that you can use in your classrooms. And let's go to the next piece. But before we do that, I want to just slide in uh, very cunningly a little bit of theory here and try to not to do that too much. But I cannot talk about listening and language teaching without talking about comprehensible input because a lot of people think just um, just by talking at students or communicating with them that that constitutes a good way of exposing students to language and it really does not comprehensible input is something that um, was defined by Stephen Krashen and for anybody who um, wants to learn more about it I'm not going to go into all detail but there's a three-minute video link I embedded here um, that you can go to and listen to. Um, and uh, that will give you a very good short orientation. And then you can go on Google or another um, uh, tool to look, out, look up more information on this. But in short, comprehensible input is something that's uh, a very artful and skillfully done way of presenting students, um, incorporating where they are, incorporating where they need to go, giving them cues, and being extremely mindful of what language you use. That's, for instance, um, keeping idioms and slang out of your language, not being sarcastic, and making language very unambiguous in listening activities so students can um, actually um, follow what you're saying and focus on the message. And it's very, very hard to do that. And just being a native speaker or somebody who knows the language does not necessarily help because one needs to really understand where the students are in that moment in order to move them to a new place. 
So I really encourage people that haven't had that training yet to um, learn about comprehensible input. Let's move on to the next slide. So I, I really think, and I, I always have been saying that listening is the most important foundation of language learning. When students are happy, when you give them something to do, when you do a TPR, total physical response, they can follow tasks, they can do something and actually produce something with the language. They feel so good about themselves. And then they trust themselves, too, to write and to read and to speak. But first comes the listening skill. And, um, you know, and that's like with babies, too. You know, babies first get a lot of input before they produce language. And so that's why I think it's the most important foundation to keep people to study the language and to be successful. OK, and uh, any the next slide, please? So I'm going to present a couple of slides to you where I show you um, a low level, a medium, and a high level of proficiency. And hopefully, you know, in our classes, we will progress from low to high. And so here, here's like a contrast of observable behavior that you can measure and see if students can actually do it. And um, that will give you information as a teacher on being on task. So on the lowest level, for instance, uh, students could uh, imitate a beat or movement in class, just observe and go with you. And that's kind of the whole music part um, because that gets students really involved. Then when they get on a higher level, um, they are responding to songs. Um, you're giving them illustrations, gestures, movements, or instruments, model things for them. And they're responding to the songs. And not just imitating a beat or movement, but then they're responding to songs and using words. And on the highest proficiency level, uh, they can follow the entire lyrics of the song and respond accordingly in groups or even individually. So that's like moving the people from the lowest to the highest level and being very mindful on the level that they're on and moving them on the continuum. The next one, please. This one was, by the way, a pre-K and K. And I know in many countries, people are not going to school um, in pre-K and K, like in the United States. But um, in Germany, it's called kindergarten or whatever. But I know that many countries do um, language instruction already in very early grades. So I'm, I give you some examples for that. And of course, I've used all these activities also with adults, because um, like our secondary literature says, um, students oftentimes are infantilized in the way they do activities as adults. So they um, kind of have similar um, production, like um, first language production. So let's look at another example. Um, students could recognize recreational objects from pictures as the teacher is telling the names of the objects. Or on, on a higher level, they can follow instructions in two steps from pictures and spoken instructions. For instance, show me the slide and show me a hand movement of what the slide movement is. You know, so um, you can have two different um, um, steps. On the highest level, they can simulate activities. Um, for instance, uh, find a chair, go all in line, single file. Um, everybody gets up and organized by um, size from small to high. And they can do that in listening activities. And you know that they get it. And if somebody doesn't get it at first, they get it when they do it with the whole group. And then you know as a teacher that they know it. Next one, please. So the next one is also a pre-K uh, K book concepts um, idea here. Um, for instance, uh, point to features of the book. What is the title of the book? What is the author? Point to it with your finger. And you can actually see each student how they're doing it. And um, then um, the ne next step would be to, be to work with a partner, where the partner gives these other commands about what to point to. And then it's more on a student level. 
And uh, in the last prize proficiency, uh, the teachers uh, are reading a text, and the students would match pictures in the right sequence. And what I did with that in class was I cut pictures out. Today, you can um, print them out, of course, and students can put the pictures in the sequence of the story in front of them, like a cartoon, kind of. And then you see that they really understand the story. And um, you know, there are so many examples like that. And I can see some of yours that you're coming up with. Good job, everybody. Next one. Next one is for um, grades one or two. Um, you know, um, the uh, the teacher would make statements and point to um, with statements about the school or places, and students would uh, point to the places on pictures. Or in a little bit higher um, developed listening activity, um, the students would re relate uh, school places and people. Goodness, I have a lot of misspellings in that. They would relate it to pictures in a series. And then in the last high level, match all descriptions with individual spoken needs. So um, there are a lot of different um, steps involved. You know, it has more complexity. And uh, but these are all listening activities now, where the teacher would the teacher or one student would give oral descriptions, and the other ones would match it up. Okay, next one. Um, for level level three to five, um, following oral com commands um, and model movement. For instance, show us how to roll a ball, or how can you turn a chair over? And I, I usually do crazy stuff in class, like balance the chair on, depending on how ro rowdy the students are, you can see um, how far you can get them. You know, can you, um, balance a chair on one leg um, in your hand or something. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all of this in detail because you can do that later when you look into the um, into the presentation, but you get the point. From simple to complex language, guide the students first by giving them single commands and then um, Add more and more and more complexity to it, you know, which does in essence the same thing, but the students have to decode a lot more language in their head. And when you carefully prepare them for it, you know, in carefully scaffolded activities, like I'm showing you here, they will always know what to do. Next one, please. So the next one is an example. Um, you know, um, where you use polite or informal forms of the language. First, you can do one-step commands, you know, um, um, show somebody how you greet somebody in Germany. And that would be shaking a hand, which in other cultures you may not do. And um, then you can add more and more and more steps to it, you know, using formal and informal language and form of address and um, start with the simple and go to the more complex, like we discussed before. OK, next one. So this one is 6 to 8. Um, you know, identify supplies for school activities. And the highest level is evaluate and select resources for a test. You can put a whole bunch of school supplies on, on the floor I always do everything on the floor. I get everybody on the floor in a big circle. Everybody gets sitting down on the floor, push the chairs aside, and crawl around and be crazy. And I do that with adults, too. And so um, ask the students, you know, you make one corner of the room all the art supplies and put all the other cor corner of the room all the language art supplies. And um, put one corner of the room all the math supplies. And then students can wiggle around. And when they actually connect an action to the listening activity, they will anchor the information much more securely in their brain. We know that. Next one. So again, you know, you see the point. You know, first they do um, 
a simple request that they carry out, and uh, later on they need to um, identify relevant information from high-level complex discourse. You know, for instance, at first I may say, if you go, if you need to go to the bathroom, get the hall pass. And then I can, in the highest proficiency, read to them a whole bunch of more rules about using the bathroom, but in a more complex language. And then they need to identify the relevant information from that and maybe mark it down on a chart. But the point is to carry them from simple to complex. Next one. So here's one um, activity where you can create an environmentally friendly community. In many countries, people are very interested in that. And um, you can um, say, see this um, later on you know, in all details. Um, you have five different levels how you can move them up in complexity. Next one. There's an example of learning measuring. That is really cool because when you talk about metric and, uh, and non-metric systems, you know, uh, it, it really is a big cultural issue too. So um, for instance, uh, follow oral instructions to identify the length of objects for following a model, doing that with a partner, and in the end, following a multi-step instruction to compare the length of parts objects with a partner, and then you can use that T-chart in the end. And uh, the teacher is giving the instructions, or the students can give each other instructions also. And uh, but you see, you know, first you just follow one instruction, and later on you compare, which is a much more complex activity. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay, so what does everything, what do all these activities have in common? Next, please. Next slide. So all of these activities had the goal of uh, learning authentically, something that they actually do in their school lives or as adults they do in their lives. Um, and uh, you can measure as a teacher if your students actually um, successfully did the listening activity and didn't just take in but actually did something with it. And it has an incredible um, anchoring effect on their brain. Everything that they do an activity with it and uh, complete something will be anchored much more firmly in their brain as an active language production and uh, neuron building activity. Next, please. So in addition to the stuff that we talked about before, um, I gave you a definition of the comprehensible input of caution, which is to um, always, always, always be mindful of what language you use, for what purpose you use, um, what, what kind of outcome you expect from your comprehensible input, and eliminate your language of all <clears throat> ambiguities of everything, um, of everything that, um, you know, um, can throw them off task, so they can really focus on the, on the authentic language. And, um, then specific activities <clears throat> depending on the student's uh, cognitive level where they are. Now, as I said before, you know, for adults, um, you know, the um, a lot of times the same activities are used the same activities with adults than with kids. You know, but with kids, it's so much more important to be mindful of the cognitive development that they have. And if they have not learned something in their own language and in their own schooling yet, they, of course, cannot do it in second language learning either. And that particularly applies to grammar instruction. And again, we lost a couple of pictures on here. Way, I'm really sad. Um, so um, now we can forget this slide because it doesn't show all the pictures on it. <laughs> can you go to the next one? 
students want to be motivated and they're motivated by um, being able to do something with the language. And there's nothing more demotivating to students than being talked at by the teacher and sitting there and um, just feel things are going over their head and the teacher doesn't really connect with them. And I don't know about you, but when I, um, you know, um, when, when I was in school, I always knew when it was my turn to be called on by the teacher and I was ready like to be the fourth next person and I prepared only for that. And it was so predictable what the teacher wanted to hear. It was mostly a grammar form and so I did, didn't really pay attention to the rest of the class that much. And of course that doesn't really give you a lot of language knowledge. Can we go to the next slide? So every activity and lesson needs to count um, by preparing our listening activities very carefully so the students can get the most mileage out of it. Next please. So um, with that, I'm uh, ready to take your questions. And I don't know if somebody wants to facilitate questions or, um, you know, or um, First of all, let me also say to you that um, a lot of the information that I have presented here today is taken from what's called the WIDA, and you have the reference at the last slide, so you don't have to write it down. Um, WIDA has a detailed description on every topic, every grade level, and um, every school subject that you can get for free from the internet site. It's a nonprofit organization. And no matter if you are in other countries or in America, you can use it. And it gives you all the definitions. And I drew heavily for this presentation on um, the WIDA materials because they are awesome. Because um, they, they make everything measurable for the teacher. So that takes a lot of work out in planning for the teachers. So um, any questions on your part? I'll and can a little bit with questions. Can everybody see and hear me? Yes, I agree, Teresa. Great presentation, full as usual when Dr. Brody gets going, full of uh, great tips, great insights in second language acquisition. And as she said, she likes that we're focusing on specific areas. Uh, she could talk about any area, uh, but she has a, great insights about listening for us today. Uh, any links? Well, we will have, uh, before you take questions, make sure you understand that uh, her slides will be uploaded so you can take a look at them, you know, at your own pace. Also watching the recording again and we'll have, uh, we should have, since I see uh, Skilvia Sylvia is here and Dr. Nelly was here a little earlier, we should have a YouTube um, video link also for today. Ah, blog. Good question, Nabila. She has a nice blog. Uh, I've been lucky to be uh, featured a few times in her blog. Could you type in uh, the blog? It looks like Dr. Browdy. BrowdyESL.wordpress.com. Also, and this is just in general, just put in Dr. Crystal Browdy in, in Google or another uh, search engine, and you'll see Browdy ESL. I have, I have a, so if you don't remember, where's the dot of WordPress? Oh, and uh, on, 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 can you hear me? Sorry? On Facebook? Um, uh, it's going in and out now. I think, it's just, I think it's just where your mouth is because you're moving, that's all. Okay, so on Facebook, I have a Facebook site of Brody ESL where I post every single day. Yeah, she's, she's really on Facebook a lot with good stuff, both uh, in ELT and other stuff too that she finds. Um, so definitely you want to follow her there. Any other questions? Please come back. <laughs> She's, she's here. She's not going. I'm not letting her go anywhere. <laughs> On Facebook, just look up uh, Crystal Brody or Brody ESL, Brody ESL and you'll Brody find her. Brody ESL, not Crystal Brody. That's my private one. Brody oh. ESL is the ESL site. Thanks, Sylvia. Great. Thanks, Sylvia. And, that's, <laughs> and that's also the name. And, and remember, folks, uh, on the class page, so... Uh, Crystal, you'll be going to your class page, I imagine. 
to interact there. Uh, you can post anything there that you like. Um, the, other, the other thing, everyone, is, uh, and I need to always remember to mention this, if you ever can't find someone's link and you really need it, go to the About Course page because everyone's, all the presenters are hyperlinked to their main pages. So I remember putting in uh, Crystal's blog for that. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a Facebook group. That's right. There's a lot of stuff happening in the gr in her group. So check it out. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Dr. Naughty. I'm also on Twitter, if you want to um, follow each other on Twitter, um, Brody ESL. I, let me let me do this one more time here. Brody ESL, um, you know, is an easy one too to remember on all social media. LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. And my other big area of interest is technology and using really cool technology to create our activities, you know, um, making so much easier to have authentic, beautiful pictures and materials for our kids. Just check out technology. So what do you, what do you think, does she belong here with us? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, wonderful. I, I almost want people to, I mean, I'm glad you're writing these things down. We're putting them here. But I almost want to say, just go to the pre-class task because we want to see a lot of activity there, um, and you know that way you can ask uh, questions. Uh, not that we can't now, um, but you might want to. Obviously, some people, most people, are watching are watching this or will watch it asynchronously, meaning they will watch it after the live class. So they'll go to the pre-class task at different points. So if this is a topic that interests you, uh, specifically a lot of really focus focusing on listening building listening skills here. So if this is something um, you're interested in and or want to be uh, more uh, uh, connected with different people on it, getting different points of view, go to the class page. I will post the post-class task, but not for a day or two. Uh, there are plenty up there for, for everyone. Uh, don't worry about the deadline. Uh, it's the 20th, but the ones at the end, I'll probably extend and give people more time if they want to do uh, those post tasks the, from the final classes. Any other questions? Yes, thank you, Sylvia. And thank you, Dr. Nelly, Dr. N, Dr. D, Dr. Jigsaw, who is popping in and out of the class today. I see her here. You're welcome, Yolanda. Any other questions? We have a few minutes. Why don't you send emails explaining what you are saying? <laughs> is that for me, Dora? Or is that for... <laughs> The problem, I don't mind sending emails. You can also send me an email and I'll send you anything you want. How's that? <laughs> okay. Dora, just inbox me anywhere you like. And I promise I'll get back to you. Uh, any other questions for Dr. Naughty Brody? <laughs> or Crystal. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if that was the plan. You, 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 you are the one who did that today. You said Naughty Brody and now... And you know how quickly I collocate things. I know. <laughs> Especially when they rhyme. Or Crystal the Pistol. Oh, Crystal the Pistol, Naughty Brody. It's turning into a chant. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? You guys can email me or go to the, no, I mean, let's go to the, take it to the class page. And so. There was one, maybe I missed it. Maybe I missed it. Yeah, well, we'll just see if anyone wants to ask a live class. In the future, we will have break-off groups from this MOOC where we can turn people's mics on and things like that. But for now, we're not doing that. Have you asked the students to assess their own listening? Excellent question. Actually, uh, connects to uh, what Jason West is going to talk about uh, tomorrow. Uh, go ahead, Crystal. Well, yeah, I mean, everything I talked to, to you about was about asking students to assess their own listening because Every time they actually do something with the language they're listening to, they know that they are actually uh, successful in their listening and assessing it, you know. And so, yes, we can ask them, how do you feel about um, finding three pieces of information in what you just heard in this video clip or audio clip? And, uh, or ask them how many of these pieces of information did you get, you know, and uh, can do that with a partner, by yourself, 
depending on the age of the students and their motivation, uh, you can uh, do all kinds of different things, you know. I always like when I can actually, as a teacher, also have an impression and when the student can self-assess them too, themselves. So I mm. want to always know the teacher yeah. is my class well class time spent well that my students learn something. You know, but the more developmentally able they are as adults or teenagers, middle schoolers, they can self assess themselves, of course. Yeah, and the tools, uh, as we've seen in almost every class, including crystals, are they're just getting easier and easier to use. Uh, who was just Chuck Sandy was just gave us some. If you haven't seen that class, uh, def definitely want to check that out. Uh, obviously, Shelly Terrell's class. Um, also, Jack Askew was talking about uh, specific tools that now are so easy to use for students to record their own listening to evaluate themselves in groups to listen to each other and then of course for the teacher uh who has more experience usually um uh, to to offer his or her insight you know, too um can I throw out one more tip one thing i really like is um you know if students have um electronic devices digital devices available as a teach as a teacher to outsource out of the classroom a lot of the listening activities uh, and let them uh, be used by the students either in class or outside of class on their own devices, you know. Yeah, yeah, and there's a chat going about own well, devices. You know, I, I think... Um, that's go ahead. also very important Please. for people that need to hear things more often, so they are uh, self-paced and they have the control of how often they can hear something in order to understand it, you know, and it, it makes it less stressful which is also one of Stephen Carson's tenets, you know, to say we should make sure that they don't have affective filters between them and the learning, you know, to make it most easy for them. And sometimes it means to hear it ten times instead of once for some people. That's oh, absolutely. Digital device yeah, and people. if and if it's interesting enough, if it's engaging enough, they'll want to hear it multiple times. And I mean, to me, that's that's the bottom line here, and that's also what Krashen's talking about. It's not just the effective filter; it's the engagement and interest. Um, and uh, yeah, we're 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 at a time, don't you think? Where you know, if we talk about confiscating cell phones, well, I think that once stu students are engaged, you know, whether it's the old days where they're doodling in the margins or looking out the window or writing notes, it's the same thing with looking at a cell phone. You can use the cell phone for an activity in a class if you're engaged. If it's not engaging, um, you know, then there's something wrong with, I think, not, not, I'm not saying there's something wrong directly, the teacher is a bad teacher, but uh, we're all getting used to this transition with devices and technology, but I think the basic rules rules are, are, are the same, which is that, you know, if, if you do something engaging enough, then a tool, in this case, the cell phone, can be used for just yeah, that. And actually, as a matter of fact, I always recommend to my students here um, when they have students that are poor that cannot afford cell phones, you know, to ask other people to collect their old devices and just use them for internet service in school as a hotspot. And then I give every student a cell phone and use that to teach them, you know. Even in my own family, I raised a ch my child bilingually. And when she was little and she wanted to have a cell phone and, and writing on it, uh, I said, only when you write every email and message to me in German. You know, and so then um, we just made that our rule and then she used German, you know, for, for that to get her phone. You know, so why don't you use the same yeah. principle in class, you know, and, uh, and say, yeah, you can, you can use your phone, but make it a learning activity then for the students, you know, and mm -hmm. record. Yeah, make and a fun learning activity. <laughs> I give a lot of um, hints on my on my blog on how to record audio, you know, and so the teacher can record audio and then send it to the students, and they can use it for listening yeah. activities yeah. on their devices. And you can find all of those on my technology blog. You know, check out the blog. Check out check out her group. Uh, and I have a couple other questions here. Um, someone wants to know about using iPads in your classes. I'm, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to tell you the questions. That's yeah. one. Uh, I won't forget. My, another one is, what do you do with passive students in your class? This came earlier, and I jotted it down. I want to make sure I ask you, because, because you did mention um, getting them in circles and doing crazy stuff, and even the adults. 
Uh, that sounds great, but do you ever struggle uh, with getting passive students to be involved? Well, that goes back to my uh, beginning slide that says get to know your students. You know, you may have a student that doesn't want to make a fool out of themselves, you know, and so maybe that student is uh, much better working with technology in, in more individual ways, you know, and allowing them ways to do that. And don't force them to make a fool out of themselves if they don't want to do it. And so, uh, as yeah. always, the very first rule needs to be know your students. And then you teach them where they are. And you they're really loud on the chatter mm. you know they're really loud. and oftentimes the opposite you know the class clowns uh, don't have their audience in writing you know the same way so using a good mixture mm. of both uh, technology and face-to-face and, uh, -face activities and extending the classroom into the virtual one gives every student a chance to shine. Yeah, I mean, the the, you know, but I, no. the, the the possibilities with blended learning as far as reaching different personalities and learning styles, it's, it's just extraordinary. Um, and we should take advantage of that. I just want to add, whether it's in the physical group or a blended group or virtual group uh, of students, you can assign roles. I hate saying it that way. You can, you can get students to, you know, choose and adopt different roles that suit them better so if ever you know this is this is once you get to know the students as, as dr brody city then you get and uh, you put them in groups you can get into the habit of uh having one person do something that's more communicative directly or more use their outgoing personality their shy personality right yeah, yeah and they can for instance be the timekeeper or yes. the secretary or whatever if you use the collaborative grouping you know but, but it's always going back to what we said before. You need to be purposeful in what you're doing. You need to do it for a reason. You should not just do things because they're fun, you know, but you do it because you want to reach a certain goal with your teaching. What's that time? You need to know your students and where they are and where you want to go and then pick the right stuff to get everybody there. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? I mean, that's kind of your philosophy too, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think the more that we connect with other teachers and learners around the world through technology, the more we are gravitating to one another, sharing some of these same ideas. So, you know, I watch all these presentations and I'm thinking, you know, we have these distinct personalities as teachers and approaches and everything else, but these they're these very fundamental uh, notions that we believe in and we share. Uh, how about um, iPads? Do you use iPads? Somebody wants to know. Tablets or yeah, to me, yeah. To me, iPads and tablets are oftentimes hailed as the one teaching. They're almost like a silver bullet approach, you know. Like oh, now we teach with iPads. Wow, what a change, you know. But to me, it's like good teaching is good teaching, and bad teaching is bad teaching. And a bad teacher yeah. with an iPad will still be a bad teacher, you know. However. When you have iPads and tablets available, you have some possibilities of things that you can do. You know, um, you have great internet, you have great uh, visuals, and you can do vir virtual field trips. Mm. You can do things. But you can also do them on a um, laptop computer. You can also do them on your phone. Yep. So to me, it's not the question iPad or not iPad. It's like having a digital extension to your classroom and be a good teacher. Exactly. And you I, know, and using all I think it's back to those roles in the groups again. So the roles also can be defined somewhat by the type of technology people have or prefer. If they have no technology, they share with a partner and get to know that technology. And we are very close, I think, to, uh, you know, or the future is here now kind of thing where 
you know, it, the school districts that traditionally, you know, spent money on textbooks, right? It's, it's more just a transition to getting used to <laughs> what's coming more than it's a money issue in a lot of cases because the prices for these textbooks, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, you know, so I, I think, yeah, technology at first seemed like we have to have this new budget and this, this sort of, you know, uh, ex ex extra thing, but, you know, very soon, uh, you know, you're not going to, people will bring their own devices, but those who don't have them, there will be devices for them, so. Yeah, and let me, let me give you an example of what you just said, okay? So since I have a school-age child, um, you know, her math books are from 1990. For a child that's just over 10 years old, that's ancient, right? <laughs> I mean, that's like more than ancient. So her, and also it doesn't jive anymore with the way we teach today. So what the teacher does is she cannot make new books, but she lets the kids, she teaches them with Khan Academy video. Mm, great. Okay. So she gives them for each topic a list of Khan Academy uh, videos or other resources to go home. And that is uh, part of the learning activity and the resources they use is Khan Academy or any other resources, and every teacher is catching on to that, you know, it doesn't matter foreign language staff or not, we're all able to use such an incredible wealth worldwide of information with technology that the teachers is really need to. But on the last note, I want to say that there's a book that is coming out in January, it's called Children and Languages Making the Match, and I can write it down in the class for a yeah. Um, so make sure you look in, the class, in the class page also when you're there we can continue because we only have a few minutes left but keep going yeah so I wanted to say that this book is like a fat book of hundreds and hundreds of pages of activity ideas kids and adults alike you can use it even though it's it's listed as a kids teaching mm. book um, I was part of authoring um, the main author of the technology chapter and every activity in your classroom is interfaced with technology ideas. And that book is coming out in January. Great. You know, so I'm going to put it out because that may be of interest to our readers. Um, it, it's a book only with resources on how to teach. Lots of activities, you oh, know. That's fantastic. That's Practical stuff. <laughs> Good. Yeah, no, anyone out there who's worried about students not having enough money for technology or the or your schools not buying them yet or yourself not trained in it, feeling intimidated, don't worry. It's just going to get easier and easier. Uh, if you're interested now, uh, especially with the group we have here, I think this is a great time to experiment, to go and check out uh, these app, app applications, uh, these tools, uh, just get your feet wet. And and uh, but you know there's nothing to fear about the future. On the contrary, it's just going to get easier and easier for all of us. Uh, great suggestion here. Next session be about teaching every skill with technology. Uh, I'll give you a little hint since you're here. Probably the next MOOC in March. Since we're getting to the end here, it's probably going to focus on speaking. Uh, and when I say speaking, you know, you say, well, we're doing listening and pronunciation. Well, yes, but more on strategies for getting students to speak and using speaking because it's such an important one. I think the tools are going to keep coming. I don't want to have a tools uh, MOOC so much as I want to keep looking at our skill areas. And then within the skill areas, obviously, all the functions and the topics and everything. So I think, you know, we're really going to look at, uh, we'll do vocabulary again. We'll do a, a writing. Uh, probably a reading and writing uh, together will probably be the next one. We'll probably just go like that because I, I, I anticipate, um, as I'm seeing in this MOOC, people bringing in the technology that goes, uh, you know, works well with whatever the skill area is that, that we're focusing on. Good. And I hope you'll all be back for that one in March. We have just a couple minutes left. Dr. Crystal Naughty Brody, Crystal Pistol. <laughs> Just, just remember, I'm going on record here, permanent record, that it was you who introduced those uh, words to rhyme with your name. So when I'm using them out in social media land, nobody accuses me of being a little extreme or something. With that. <laughs> nobody will be surprised. I, people know me. I'm, I'm crazy. I love it. We're all crazy. If you're not crazy, get out of the MOOC. You're dismissed. <laughs> Um, I'm glad you'll be here in March, Armando. Armando, you're amazing. 
Claudia, an esteemed facilitator, saying goodbye. Dr. Nelly Deutsch, who is everything and everyone here. <laughs> Nevis in Italy. <laughs> Godan in Serbia. Oh, it's going too fast for me. Virginia and Mexico. I love you too, Dr. Jigsaw. Um, Olga in Mexico, saying goodbye. Thank you so much for coming today. <laughs> Dr. Brody, it was great. Glad you were here again. Yeah, Vanessa you Vanessa wasn't here. I'm sure Vanessa will be watching the recording. Peace and respect to Vanessa. Are you, Sorry, go ahead. Are you singing? Say what? Are you singing before we leave? If you want me to sing, then I can. She wants me to rap, my man. That's what Dr. Nelly D said. I'll try to think of something coming right off the top of the head. Peace and respect to all of you who came. ELT Techniques teachers. Let's arrange ways that we can keep connecting into the future. Peace to you and yours. It's almost the holidays for certain people in the U.S. that I got some video for you. We're going to put it up soon. Stay calo tuned. 20 seconds left. Yes, Merry Christmas. I'm asking you all what's on your wish list. Peace to Olga, Mohammed, and Claudia. Oh, my goodness. It's almost time to go. ELT Techniques teachers, we love you so. Peace and much respect.